It's a Monday here in the basement. We got the coffee. I've got an apple. I've got my friends OG and Doug sitting here with me. And you know what that means? That means it's time for our Navy Federal shout out, OG. Time for our shout out to the men and women of our armed forces. What is that mug? This is the this is the replacement for the infamous mug. This is the mug. This is the mug. This is the one that crashed and burned. This is the mug you're worried about in the losing? worst way. I'm trying to do a Navy Federal shutout, and you're all about the the fishing mug. I'm so excited about my mug. But I would think that the men and women in the Navy, like, don't they don't they do their fishing from boats? I mean, they're not they're not in waders along the side of the river. Like they'd be out in a pretty boat, difficult to troll off the back of a carrier. Yeah. <laughs> sir, could you launch the trolley motor, please, sir? We're trying to catch us some tuna. <laughs> Son, we're going to war. But but we could get some tuna along the way, right, sir? I'm trying to feed the crew, sir. That's what we need. Morale, sir. Well, and on behalf of uh, those of us here in the basement making podcasts and the men and women at Navy Federal Credit Union, big shout out to our troops out catching some tuna. 30 seconds to yeah, hear. What do you think about flowers for the show notes? These are for the guests. Uh, hey, I need some tea? more books for these mics. Anyone have the promo for the show notes? Wait, where's the Fiji water? Is this, this isn't, is this tap water? 15 seconds. Can somebody get the cat? I can't drink tap Grab water. Grab the cat. Can, can someone get tell Joe's mom to stop vacuuming? It's not hard to find. Has anybody this seen feet. my hair gel? Tesian water. Natural. Quiet on the set. Live in three, two. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and you learned everything you needed to know about investing in school, right? (laughs) Between the history of Phoenicia and square dancing, most of us left our public school education with zero knowledge about how money actually works. Uh, You know, apart from the stiff repercussions of borrowing 50 cents for milk from Scott Church. Today, to fully rectify this, we welcome the author of Why Does the Stock Market Go Up? Brian Feraldi. For our TikTok Minute, we'll see where those gas pump zip code questions are really headed in the future. In our headlines, one star is in the news. And no, we're not talking about Will Smith. Like we're the only people not talking about Will Smith. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven lifeline to Jordan, who's looking for a little advice on spending all the Benjamins he's stacked. Oh, I've got some investing tips for him. And then, like the cherry on this hot fudge Sunday of a podcast, I'll share my lava hot market trivia. And now, two guys who I should have been listening to in high school, about money that is, definitely not about girls, it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. Hey everybody, and a happy Monday to you. We are here at your service getting ready to help you celebrate the beginning of another week. I'm Joe Saul C. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter and across the card table from me, ready to bring it, it's Mr. OG. Can you believe it's already April? I, I can't believe it's April. Why do people always say this? Like, oh my God, there's a calendar and they measure the days and the, the, the clock just keeps on moving. A quarter of this year is already gone, Doug. I feel like we were just talking about the beginning of the year. We're talking about resolutions. We're cleaning up our debt from last year. And now a quarter of the year is gone. It is gone. But the good news is, OG, we're here to usher in a much more glorious quarter. What, what was wrong with the first quarter? I like the first quarter. It was good. I'm just saying we can do better. I like every quarter. Don't you think we can do better? You're never happy. I'm so tired of the fact that you're never happy with anything that we do. I am very happy. You know why? Because we got Brian Feraldi here today. Brian Feraldi talking stocks with us. We're going to do Stocks 101. And so if you're going to be on the individual stock train, we're going to talk about how to buy stocks for the long term. But even more than that, you know, a lot of people think the stock market's magic. Wall Street is rigged and that uh, you can't make money. And he's going to talk about how you can make money in a very responsible way. Before that, we got a TikTok minute. We got some big headlines on celebrities. But first, distracted driving is a serious problem on our roadways, leading to the deaths of thousands of people and injuries in the hundreds of thousands each year. 
when you take your eyes and your focus off the road, even for a second, it can be deadly, not just for you, but for other drivers, pedestrians, and bicyclists. Sadly, many Americans use their cell phones while driving, whether it's texting, checking emails, scrolling media feeds, or any other form of distraction. Drivers are putting themselves and others around them at great risk. It's important to know that 48 states ban texting and driving. Also, 25 states prohibit all drivers from using cell phones while driving. Distracted drivers are not only putting people at risk, they're probably also breaking the law. Look, it's dangerous to use your cell phone behind the wheel. That's why law enforcement officers write tickets and enforce hands-free and anti-texting and driving laws. When you're driving, put down your phone and keep your hands on the wheel, your eyes on the road, and your mind on the task of driving. Remember, you drive, you text, you pay. Brought to you by NHTSA. All right, Brian Feraldi waiting in the wings, so let's, uh, let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from PBS.org. Uh, not the big news most people are talking about, but did you see the news about Bruce Willis? Yeah. I saw there was news about Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis is stepping away from acting after a diagnosis of aphasia, a condition that causes loss of the ability to understand or express speech, his family announced last week. In a statement posted to his Instagram page, the 67-year-old actor's family said Willis was recently diagnosed with aphasia and that it is impacting his cognitive abilities. This is a quote, as a result of this and with much consideration, Bruce is stepping away from the career that has meant so much to him, read the statement signed by Willis's wife, Emma Hemming Willis, his ex-wife, Demi Moore, and his five children, rumor scout Tallulah, Mabel, and Evelyn. We're moving through this as a strong family unit and wanted to bring his fans in because we know how much he means to you as you do to him. This is quite a shock to me, OG, in an age where we see actors doing films into their 80s, sometimes into their 90s. Bruce Willis at 67. 67, I remember when I was a kid, felt like people were pretty old. Now, to me, it seems very, very young. I'm just impressed that he uh, had the wherewithal to say it's time to move on and do different things in my life now. I think a lot of people will still try to for lack of a better term, stumble through whatever it is that they're dealing with, as opposed to, you know, trying to go get the help or, you know, whatever, whatever they need to do to take care of themselves. You know, so much of the stuff that we talk about and so much of the work around financial planning is trying to get to that point, right? Like I'm trying to get to the thing that I'm now able to do the stuff that I want to do, right? I'm going to, I'm going to suffer now so that I can have fun later, And this is, I think, another great example of why you have to have balance because, you know, tomorrow's not promised to everybody and now what, you know? Yeah. And you never know when it's going to be gone. And if it is because of a stroke or a head injury that he had, which is happens a lot with aphasia, you don't know when that's going to happen. This is another reason. I mean, luckily, Bruce Willis's films, it says here, amassed more than $5 billion in box office worldwide. So Bruce, I would guess, probably has enough money to be okay for the rest of his life. Hopefully. But if something, if some type of a disability happens when you're in your late 20s, 30s, 40s, even early 50s, I see so many people not think about disability insurance, OG. And you think about what if this had happened to you and you were younger? Something that I, I don't know. I think more of us need to worry about what if that income stream goes bye-bye? Yeah, you know. I am going to jump in here because I, I kind of like where OG was headed with this at the beginning. We talked about, oh, his movies have been made $5 billion. A, of course, you know, even if he's the lead actor, which he was in many of those, <laughs> they get a small fraction of that, right? Unless they've cut deals on percentages. So it, it doesn't matter how much money was rolling in. It matters how he spent it as as he, as the money was rolling in. So you look at a Nicolas Cage who was having, he's making all of these awful movies because he has to, because he spent money like a drunken sailor on, on shore leave. And uh, he has to, to keep on working and making these horrible movies. And I think there are still five movies in the can for Bruce Willis that haven't been released yet that I heard he had to make as well. So I guess the lesson here is, you got to throttle yourself. Yeah, you're talking about seven lean years and seven fat years. 
Yeah. Don't live high in the hog when things are going great. You still have to be somewhat measured in your approach along the way. Right. I yeah. think those two things dovetail, though, don't they? I mean, the, the, the idea of keeping keeping the money train moving by having good disability coverage, but on the other hand, you know, not living this boom bust lifestyle. How often, OG, if you work with people that that get a commission or they have uneven paychecks and they're on this steak dinner ramen noodles diet, you know, that fluctuates a ton just based on when money's coming in. That's not a healthy way to live. This guy. Oh, that wasn't a shot across the bow. All right. Good. <laughs> just want to make sure. <laughs> How did you know I had ramen yesterday? You and talking to me? No, I mean, we've all we've all done it. I remember the first large paycheck that I got from America Express. The, the first thing I did was I went to the Townsend in Birmingham and, you know, on Valentine's Day and had a big... That'll blow most of it. <laughs> it did. It was... had a great bottle of wine and a nice plated dinner and sat next to Steve Iserman. And, you know, it was just like a cool thing. And I'm like, I should do more of this. And then probably should have put that money in my Roth IRA or into my brokerage account. But then by the same token, like I just got done saying, did Steve get upset when you sat at his table? No, he was cool. It's like, Hey, move over. I got a big, I got a big paycheck, Stevie. Yeah. I got this round. I got this round. <laughs> I don't bro. think you know who I am, Stevie. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. yeah. When he knew, he knew Iserman wasn't a fighter. So he knew he wasn't going to get put up against the boards by Stevie. Y. That wasn't his role. So I'm like, I could take this guy sitting here, Steve. He was actually pretty cool. I remember that was right when he had like his knee injury or something or one of his knee injuries, maybe. I don't know. I remember sitting there across the table from my wife and I'm like, look to your left. You know, and she's like, I don't know what you're saying. I'm like, the guy sitting right there. And she doesn't even know who he is. As he was leaving, I was like, hey, how are you feeling? I had nothing else to say. I was like, are you he's pretty good. I said, great. Good luck. You know, I, I don't know. He I still know. remembers that. Steve Eiserman still remembers that. Remember that time that OG talked to me at the restaurant? Yeah. He tells I'm everybody. Sure he he's on a podcast right now talking about this conversation. Yeah. And 97% of our listeners are like, who the hell are they talking about? Who is Steve Eiserman? <laughs> also true. But anyways, back to the point at hand. Looking back, I probably could have saved the money, but I'm also happy that I had the, you know, the nice dinner. You know, I'm happy that I that I did a little something with the the success or the windfall or whatever. I mean, it's I think once you get to the point where you're on track for your for your goals, you have to be able to be okay with spending a few bucks. And I think if I listen to Doug's intro correctly, it sounds like we have a question about that coming up. So I want to jump into this idea, though, of covering your bases because you don't know when things are going to change. Obviously, you know, we mentioned that we weren't talking about Will Smith, but Will Smith's career could have changed um, immediately last week. But even before that, as I was digging into the movie King Richard that he won the award for, he was sued over that that movie. And imagine that you're dealing with Richard Williams and Richard Williams sells you the rights to make a movie about him. And then you get down the road into the project and you find out that he'd already sold the rights to somebody else. And so Warner Brothers, Will Smith and Richard Williams had to uh, settle a lawsuit out of court because of that. But even OG, even the slap, Jim Carrey said, and I don't want to get in too much into the slap. Everybody's talking about it. But Jim Carrey's like, hey, I would have hit him with a $200 million lawsuit. Chris Rock said, hey, I'm not doing anything. But but you never know when things are going to make a turn. Obviously, Will Smith didn't have to go up on stage and uh, create the change in his life. But things could change in a big hurry if you're anybody. Just purely from a liability standpoint, yeah. I mean, you know, you're distracted and you nudge a car off the highway or accidentally go through a stop sign, you know, because the kids are yelling and you reach back to counsel them. <laughs> Advise them. Counsel them. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know stuff happens right you, you forget to shovel your driveway and the mailman slips or something i mean there's a thousand things that are not intentional but are still your responsibility you know for those of you who have rental properties right you know everybody says oh you got to put it in an llc 
Yeah. I mean, that's true too, but you also need to have some pretty good liability coverage yeah. because if somebody does something on your property, they're going to go after the people that have the money. I mean, it makes no sense to try to sue somebody who has no money. The attorneys are pretty smart. They've wised up to the fact that insurance companies like to write checks to, to avoid settlements to or to avoid uh, uh, litigation, you know, news stories and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And litigation, the cost of it. So I don't think that the right answer is you need $47,000 a month of disability insurance and a $10 million liability policy, but you better what if the scenario is pretty good to figure out that, you know, whether or not you have the ability to, to sustain or offset any sort of any sort of issue that might come your way. And if you don't, then you have to figure out a plan for that. And maybe the answer is, you know, I need to buy more disability coverage because the stuff I have through work, you know, only covers my base salary. Or I need to have an umbrella policy because I have a pool in the backyard. That's what my insurance guy said when I, you know, we got the pool. He says, you should have an umbrella policy. I said, I have a fence that's eight feet and tall around my property. And he said, yeah, I know, but kids can climb fences. And I go, well, how's that my responsibility? He goes, it's not. But if something bad happens in your pool when you're on vacation, the easy target is you. Yeah. It's like, well, you should have had a bigger fence with barbed wire. Right. Why didn't you have armed guards posted? Right. You know, like you should have known the kids were going to come in. How do you prove that you took all of the steps? You can't. So offset it with a little bit of, with a little bit of insurance. My goal in life is to have all my what if scenarios done enough that I can afford to be country singer Eric Church. And this is another, we've now talked about a few different people in the news lately, but you see Eric Church and canceling this sold out show in uh, San Antonio last week, OG? Nope. That's a gutsy move. I'm not really up on the pop culture. Is Paula with this us? This is from uh, Variety. Listen to this. Country superstar Eric Church may be seeing a regional fluctuation in his popularity this last week. His status in his native North Carolina, probably on the rise, with the news that he'd do anything to cheer on his beloved Tar Heels in an NCAA basketball tournament game last Saturday. Church's stock in Texas, however... Could be taking at least a momentary dip, though, after he announced last Tuesday he was canceling a sold-out show at AT AT&T Center in San Antonio because it was on the same day and he wanted to go to the game. Sold-out show. That's that's financial independence. That is. Doing what you want to do when you want to do it. That's the positive spin on it, sure. He uh, he even said that it was uh, selfish and he apologized that it was selfish, but to your point, OG, hey, if he can do it, do it. What's that line in the, I don't know what movie was it, Margin Call or or Wall Street? What's the point of having FU money if you never say FU? If you never say it, that, that's billions, right? That's billions. Yeah, that's yeah. billions. Maybe in billions. Yeah. Hey, time for our TikTok Minute. This is the part of the show where we take a look at a TikTok creator doing something either brilliant or air quotes brilliant. And uh, today we're going to look at those uh, gas pumps. You know how you step up to the gas pump, you swipe your card and it asks you a question or two. Well, this is one TikTok creator says this is where he thinks we're where we might be headed. Zip code 54220. Would you like a car wash? Nope. I'll get one when it rains. Are you a rewards member? Nope. Would you like to sign up today? No. Are you aware you could get 3% back on all no, purchases? No, I wasn't. Okay. Well, you could get 3% back on all purchases. You gotta be kidding me. No. Have you seen a therapist about your anger issues? What? Is your anger just a disguise for your sadness? I don't know. You don't have a maybe button. I understand. It's going to be okay. Thank you. I just don't even want to talk to you about it. I'm here for you. Perhaps you just need a safe space to express your sadness. Yeah. Would you like a car wash? (laughs) And he's crying and singing in the car as he leaves the gas pump. That's great. That is uh, Charlie Barron's, by the way, on Instagram Reels, not on TikTok, but... Don't you get annoyed by all those questions at the pump? Just let me pump my gas. Please let me pump my damn gas. I haven't seen that many. The first probably three or four of that, you know, they seemed like plausible questions I could see happening at a gas pump. But obviously after that, it got comedic. But yeah, it's pretty annoying. Are you a member of our club? I've never been to a pump where you can answer with your voice, but they do ask a ton of questions. And sometimes the button you need to answer the question the right way doesn't line up with the way they phrase the question. 
So then I'm just pushing buttons just to proceed so I can pump my damn gas. And I've gone a long way down the choose your own ending storybook that I didn't want to go to. <laughs> I hope this ends in gas or at least maybe some free Twinkies. <laughs> That'd be, be good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up next, Brian Feraldi is a guy who has nearly 300,000 followers on his Twitter channel where he talks all about the stock market and the basics of the stock market. And for a long time, I've been a fan of Brian's because he does this in such a way that's not the, the stuff that we bemoan, which is hot stock picking. He is not a hot stock picker. He is a guy who's a long-term investor and a very successful one, but also very successful about talking about the markets in a way that makes it approachable and fun. So can't wait to talk to Brian, but as a way to get there, I think Doug, Doug, you've got a trivia question for us, I believe. I definitely have one of those. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I was just upstairs talking to Brian for all the hit. Man, where was he during my early investing years? I mean, I have done so badly in the past. Jim Cramer made a Doug indicator. Like, as soon as I bought something, he'd come out screaming, sell, sell, sell. A little known fact, the Wall Street Journal at one time was considering publishing the Indy, which was the inverse negative Doug index. If I hated it, they bought. That's why now I just buy lots of different shares. I call it sharding the market. You know, like instead of shorting. One stock you shouldn't have shorted was Microsoft. I saw how Bill Gates danced at the Windows 95 launch. Look, Bill, you can't code great software without rhythm. So I sold. Microsoft had started its public offering in 1986. But my question for you is, what year was the company actually founded? Was it 1975, 1980, or 1982? When you hear the name Navy Federal Credit Union, you probably think that it's just for members of the U.S. Navy, you would think. But in fact, Navy Federal Credit Union serves all branches of the armed forces. They even serve the families even of- if you're out. <laughs> you just go, oh, gee, whenever it's good for you, you go ahead. <laughs> just, they like it when we ad lib. They do. But, when we do it well, sure, they probably <laughs> do like that. But it is even when even when you're out. Yes. And in fact, you know what the next line I was going to read says? They even What's serve that? the families of service members and veterans of all branches. Oh, well, see, there you go. It's like I was at a premonition. <laughs> They're experts in military finances. They empathize with but, members. It, but, it, <laughs> they empathize with members' lives. I just thought that would be funny. And go above, oh boy, and beyond to make sure they don't miss out on financial opportunities. You know, it's funny. Navy Federal has helped so many people with uh, so many different situations. I know that their true car thing, I have used that to buy two vehicles. It's amazing the amount of money that you'll save just on that one benefit alone. And that's not even really a major benefit. That's just a tiny benefit of what Navy Federal can do. Imagine how good their the really good benefits are if that's just like one of their, oh, by the way, you can do this true car thing. <laughs> I know. So they are even trying on the true car thing. Imagine how good the other stuff is people. when they step up. That's why they offer rates as low as 1.79% APR on new vehicles, along with flexibility with monthly payments and terms. And now when you refinance your auto loans from another lender, you can save and get $200. If you're a member, get decisions in seconds and start saving with Navy federal credit union available to members who are active duty veterans and their families to earn and save more as a member. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Navy Federal is federally insured by NCUA credit and collateral subject to approval rates subject to change and based on credit worthiness. So your rate may differ. Refinance loan must be at least $5,000 to be eligible for the $200 terms and conditions apply. Hey there stackers. I'm, Benjamin Slacker and market pariah, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Goldman Sachs called Microsoft the IPO of the year when it came out. Though associated with the Seattle area, the company was founded in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where it was run for the first four years by Paul Allen and Bill Gates, before Gates was old enough to drink. So what year was Microsoft founded? 
If you said 1980, you're off by five years because the answer is 1975. And now, to help us catch the next great investment, let's say hello to Brian Veraldi. And here he comes. It's about time we got this guy back and not on a round table, but to truly talk about the stock market, Brian Feraldi's with us. Hey, Joe, how's it going? We got to have a board game night with uh, Brian Feraldi. That's my main goal. We got, do you play board games? I freaking love board games. Yes. What, what can we play? Perfect. Ticket to Ride, Set of Catan, I'm in. Well, you know a game that you would like based on your new book? Have you played Acquire yet? I have not played Acquire. No, I've yeah. heard many good things about it, though. And shame on me for not owning it already. Mergers and Acquisitions and uh, Stockpile. There's a good game called Stockpile. So, oh, no, dude, we got we got stuff to do. Yeah, so let's get this interview done so we can play some games. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> let's talk about this. You know, you open up your book, Brian, by talking about some of the same frustrations that I have when I hear people talk about the stock market, right? That the stock market is voodoo. That the stock, well, let's even do one. Let's put a little stank on that. What do you think when you hear people go, well, the stock market's rigged, Wall Street's rigged? Yeah, I, my, my first thought is honestly, I completely understand why people think that way, right? When if, if you don't pay attention to the market the way that we do, when is the time that the market is like in the news and people are talking about it? It's when things are going terribly. It's when the market is crashing, when 401k balances are down, when when something is wrong in the world. That's when the stock market becomes the front page of the news and people and people are talking about it. And if that's your only time in your life that you actually look at it, pay attention to it, how could you not think that it's a big gambling machine and that it's rigged and that and that things are wrong? So I totally understand why people feel that way. That's funny you say that because you know, as I think through the the media the last, you know, 30 years of my career, I think you don't hear anything good. And you would think if you just follow it casually, like people are losing money hand over fist every day. Yeah, that, that's right. Does the media ever say, well, the S&P 500 hit another new high today, right? Is that going to be something that's celebrated in the news? Is that going to get a lot of clicks or the stock market behaving normally again? It went up this year. No, nobody's going to care or pay attention to that. It's when things are going terribly. That's human nature, right? We pay attention and focus on the bad stuff. We totally do. Well, it also sells, I think, right? I mean, the advertising sells the the, uh, oh no, you got to watch out because somebody's getting robbed, so to speak, uh, also sells. You are a guy who obviously is known as an investor. You spend a lot of time talking about investments, but you are not an index fund investor. That ain't you. Is that true? Uh, so that's partially true. So if, if anybody comes up to me in real life and says, Brian, I want to invest in the market, what should I do? My default answer is index funds, right? I love index funds. I love what they stand for. I love how easy they are. I love how low cost they are. And in fact, in all my retirement funds are invested in index funds, just simply for uh, simplicity. To me, dollar cost averaging plus index funds equals stock market magic. And you can just kind of, if you can do that for 10, 20, 30 years, I'm very confident you're going to be super happy uh, with the end uh, result. But what people most associate me uh, with is that I, unlike many people uh, in the in the FI community, I, I believe in investing in individual stocks too. So beyond my retirement funds, all of my capital that's invested in the stock market is invested in companies that I handpicked and researched and bought myself. So I do love everything thing about investing and that includes researching companies and buying them. Is that because you're fascinated by it or do you really think there's an alpha there that you get for people who don't know what alpha is that you can actually do better than you can in index funds this thing that people think is elusive you think you can do it? Yes, I think I can do it. And if I, I look at my returns since I started doing this, I have outperformed uh, the S&P 500. And one of the things that is so backwards to me about uh, picking individual stocks is it's often thrown in, in your face that, well, most, the vast majority of mutual funds, the vast majority of professional investors can't beat the index fund. What chance could you possibly have as an individual investor? And what's that's that's a very logical, calm, natural sounding argument. And it's 
a big reason why I promote uh, index funds uh, so heavily versus uh, mutual funds. But what I only later discovered was that individual investors actually have a massive advantage over professional investors. And that advantage is we're not managing somebody else's money, which means we're not managing somebody else's emotions. And if, you, if you're in the fund business, you can say that your job is to beat the market and serve your clients. What's your actual job? How do you actually get paid more money? The answer is by gathering and retaining assets. You're in the asset accumulation business. And when you're running somebody else's uh, money, you have to think with career risk in mind, right? You, you have to invest so that you maximize the amount of time that you have somebody's assets, not necessarily to earn just the, the highest uh, return. So I think because of that, I actually have a big advantage over professional money managers in that I'm investing my own money. I'm not going to fire myself if I have a bad month, a bad quarter, a bad year, or anything like that. So that allows me to truly invest with a long-term, multi-year, multi-decade time horizon. This is why I love talking to you, because... I love the fact that our conversations go in ways that I didn't expect. And what's frustrating for me, Brian, is that uh, fund managers also have to follow a prospectus. So they have these guardrails on about how far away from their index they can actually move. And studies show that that makes it harder for them, right? And they're managing, in some cases, billions of dollars. And as you also know, getting billions of dollars invested versus getting a few thousand dollars invested are two totally different things. So to take these professional managers and all of these constraints they have on them and comparing it to what you and I could do is kind of looking at a, not even an apple and an orange, like they say, it's like looking at a apple and a GMC truck. Yeah, but how backwards does it sound to say that out loud, right? Know, you're, right? You're trying to convince people that like, oh, I have a huge advantage over them. They're professionals. <laughs> I'm just an amateur, right? That gives me a massive a advantage. But I think if you talk to a lot of professional money managers, they will ad ad admit that. And I just can't imagine how hard it would be to manage somebody else's money. If so I was hard. making decisions on behalf of somebody else, not I would be thinking the entire time, not only, well, what's the best for them, but I would be thinking, how can I rationally prove that this is the best way to them and convince them that this is the best way for them to invest? That's a whole nother level of thinking that I would go, have to go to to make decisions, where if you're investing your own capital, the only one that you have to convince is, is yourself. You. So yeah, that, that's it. So I think that I, as an individual amateur lover of investing, have a big advantage over other people and that I'm only investing for myself and that's it. Let's talk about diving into individual stocks because there clearly is a bunch of homework people should do. To your point, it can be a lot more fun, I think, than people think it is. How do we value a company? Let's just do the 101. And I know this can be really, really deep, Brian, but what are some of the things that you look at and what are some of the things that you ignore there? Because the one thing I see is people make this jump, right? My buddy Brian tells me that Tesla is a good investment. He owns some of it, so I just go buy it. But really, that might be the top of my funnel. There's probably a whole bunch of legwork that I need to uh, that I need to examine. And that's true for any investor that you're talking about. If so, if you find out that somebody else owns a stock, you might know that they own it, but you have no idea why uh, they bought it. And how's this? You have no idea what their intended time frame for owning that in investment uh, is. And like, I, I could go to you and say, yeah, I, I'm an investor in Tesla, which I am. It's actually my number one position uh, and has grown to just because I've owned it for so long. And I personally plan on owning Tesla for many years, but I also know that Tesla could fall 50% over the next month or, or two months. Yeah. And I have the capacity to handle that, right? The question is, do you have the capacity to, to handle that? Do, do you need, if you're going to be investing in a company like Tesla, is that capital that you're going to need in six months? In which case I would say, absolutely do not put it into the stock market, let alone an individual stock. So wait a minute. And before you go any further than Brian, what you're really saying is even before you evaluate the company, the first thing is, is to evaluate you so you know what your param your parameters are so that when you evaluate the company that it fits am i putting words into your mouth you are not. Uh, I'm a big fan of investor policy statements, right? It's like writing down at the beginning before you even start investing, how much money am I going to be invested? What is my 
what is my goal? What is my time frame? How much volatility can I handle? And how am I going to know if I'm on track? And that volatility one is actually a really, really, really important one. Because when you're looking back at a stock chart or the chart of the S&P 500, it always, it's easy to look backwards and say, of course, 2002 was a great buying opportunity. Of course, 2008 was a great buying opportunity. Look how low the, the index was at, at that time. But saying you can handle volatility and actually living through and experiencing volatility are two completely different uh, things. Uh, Jason Zweig, one of my favorite um, uh, financial writers, uh, he had a great analogy of this. It's like showing somebody a picture of a snake and saying, are you scared of this snake? And then saying, no, I'm not scared of that snake. And then taking a live snake and throwing it on their lap and saying, how about now? Are you scared of that live snake? That's the difference between thinking you can handle volatility and actually experience what it's like when your portfolio portfolio falls hard. So back to my original question then. So I, I think I really want this stock in my portfolio. What do I dive into? Are there some certain numbers that you look at first? Is there some certain way you look at the company first to determine whether it's a fit? Yeah. So when I'm coming across any, any new investment, uh, what I did for myself is I created a detailed investment checklist that I use to figure out if this stock is a good fit for me and my investing style or not. So here's a strategy I suggest everybody that does that's interested in individual stock investing. First thing to do is write down a list of all of the attributes that a company would have that you would find attractive. So when I did that, I came up with, I wanted to have a very strong balance sheet, right? Lots of cash, no debt. I want a very high gross margin. I want high returns on capital. I like positive growing free cash flow. I like positive net income. I like a wide and enduring moat. Uh, I want optionality. I want a founder run management team. I want recurring revenue business model, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I literally came up with a list of like 30 things that I would find attractive in an investment. After that, I made another list, which are a list of things that I do not want to see in an investment that I came up with. So I personally don't like it when there's accounting issues. If there's accounting issues, you're dead to me forever. I'm never going to invest in your company, right? If I can't trust the numbers, how can I make decisions? Uh, number two, I don't like customer concentration. I don't like it when a company gets an outsized portion of its revenue from just a handful of customers. Uh, how do you find, like how do you find, because a lot of this stuff that you're talking about, by the way, if people are wondering where to find this, uh, Yahoo Finance is amazing for a lot of these numbers. I'm sure there's there's a ton of places, Brian, where people can find these numbers. But how do you know that they have one customer that's a big part of their sales? Where do you dig that up? Yeah, that's in the annual report. So that's in the 10K, which is an SEC filing. The yeah. annual report of the 10K is a huge, usually multi-hundred page document that lists all of the, the business overview, the, the attributes, the financial statements, management's discussion of their results. It also lists risks. And one of the risks that could be in there is potentially customer concentration. So I just do a, a control F search for the word concentration, and it'll always, they, they by law have to tell you if they have any customers that represent 10% or sales or more. And you get that document, you get the annual report right off their website, right? The investor yep. services area, of their website. Yeah, that's the number one place that I go to. You can also go directly to the SEC database and they have all those documents there. The, the SEC has a truly treasure trove of information that investors can, can read through. It's just the tricky part is one, navigating the site because it looks like a government website and the forms <laughs> like the form is like 10K. Well, what does that mean, right? Like, or another one, another really important one, Joe, is called the proxy statement, which tells you how much stock the management team owns. That's called form DEF 14 a. It's like, who, who thinks of these things, right? Why don't they just call it the ownership form or, or something like that? Do you then, when you decide that this is a stock that you want in your portfolio, do you buy it? Do you buy it a little bit at a time? Do you dollar cost average into it? Do you buy it all right now? Do you set a, what's called a limit order so that when it hits X number, then you start buying? How do you buy your stocks? 
So it, it depends on the type of company and where it is in its in its growth phase. Uh, this is something that I've kind of learned the hard way. Let's say that uh, I didn't own shares in Starbucks, but I was interested in buying Starbucks. Starbucks is an incredibly mature, highly dependable, low risk business that has a huge, amazing track record behind it of creating value for shareholders. The company pays a dividend; it buys back stock. It's a it's a very safe reliable company. If I didn't own any and I was like, I want to own Starbucks, I would be comfortable taking a, a sizable position in Starbucks on day one. Just right. Buy. Because by the way, sizable position for me, like the biggest I would ever do is like 3% of my portfolio. That for me is like, I'm, I'm super interested in that company. That's my cap is 3% at the top. Conversely, if I found, let's say, a high growth medical device company that was launching some brand new uh, technology that I thought just had massive potential, but their revenue was just getting going, their reimbursement was just getting going, they were losing money, maybe I could see that they would, they would need more capital uh, in the future, that I wouldn't pay attention to the valuation at all. I would just buy a tiny little bit simply because I want to get a little bit of skin in the game with that company. But I would watch that company over time. And if I saw signs that the technology was catching on, revenue was growing, maybe they're launching new products. If I got signs that the thesis was on track, I would be happy to buy that company again and again and again, adding as the company continues to succeed. Conversely, if I bought a little bit up front and I saw signs that the company isn't succeeding, that's it. That's all the capital that you ever get. And you have to prove to me the onerous is on the company to grow that little bit of capital from there. Which is interesting because a company like that is going to, those numbers that you looked at at the top are, could heavily change. They could go from a no debt company to a big debt company overnight. Yes, the story could get very worse. One of my favorite quote on my investing style comes uh, from an investor that I deeply admire that not many people know. This guy's name is Tom Engel. Uh, he's been living off his portfolio for almost 40 years now after working for nine years. So he was fire way before fire was a, was a concept. And his, uh, he invests in individual stocks and he, he does it, takes a portfolio approach. But his approach to companies like that is if this company is the next great growth stock, a little is all I need. If it's not, a little is all I want. We're in a time right now where there's a lot of market volatility. You have a whole chapter of your book based on why the market goes up and why the market goes down. I want to talk about how over long periods of time, the market, the market kind of has to go up if the economy is going to continue. Walk us through that for people that still think, well, I don't know, still sounds like the casino to me, but just with a bunch of numbers that Brian has, right? <laughs> But it's so not casino over time. But can you explain to people why not? Yeah. So first, before we can talk about the stock market and the stock's long-term return, we have to back up and just say, what the heck is a stock? I think it's something that most people know, but a stock represents fractional ownership of a corporation. Fractional ownership of a corporation. When you are buying a stock, you are in a very real way becoming a very small part owner of that business. If you're going out today and you're investing in Apple stock, right? If you, let's say you put a thousand dollars into Apple today, Apple is currently worth $2.8 trillion. So if you invest a thousand dollars in that, you're becoming what 1,000 divided by 2.8 trillion. That's how much of a fraction you own of Apple. Apple, but you are in a very real way, a part owner of Apple. That means that you have a legal claim on a portion of Apple's profits and Apple's assets. So as Apple's profits, the company grow over time, the company, all things held equal, also grow over time. And that's why your value, the value of your stock will, will increase over time. Broadly speaking, stocks go up because the underlying businesses in them increase their revenue, increase their margins, increase their profits, period. That's why most stocks go up over long periods of time. And if you look at the history of 
any mega successful company, Microsoft, Netflix, Google, uh, Facebook, et cetera, why are those companies substantially worth more today than they were 10, 20, and 30 years ago? Because they're growing because a hell of a lot. revenues and profits are substantially higher today than they were 10, 20, and 30 years ago. The stock market works the exact same way. If you're going to become a part owner of the S&P 500, that means that you have bought a very small stake in 500 of the biggest, most profitable, most successful American companies. And why has the, the S&P 500 gone up, uh, delivered a return of, say, 10%-ish per year for the last 100 plus years? Well, by and large, the companies that comprise that S&P 500 have increased their profits substantially over the last 10 20 and 30 years. And there's a number of growth drivers that underline the economy that allow companies to grow over time. Let's just tick off a couple of them. Inflation. What, what is inflation? That's rising prices. Who's raising the prices? The companies, the companies, the companies that we're buying things from. So when inflation happens, their revenue and profits, broadly speaking, arise. Which uh, that's is, one. Which is why, just to stop for just a second and hang on to this, if you're looking for an investment that historically has beaten inflation, that's why stocks are a good one, by the way, period. Yes, but, yep. but because of the fact that the companies making these products are the ones raising the prices. So if you want to beat inflation, it's like if you can't beat them, join them, right? Just, yes. just join the people creating it. Very much so. Warren Buffett says the best inflation hedge is businesses that can raise prices, right? Businesses that can pass on arriving costs to, uh, to consumers. So, okay, so that's driver number one. Two, productivity. Study human race over the last, you know, thousand plus uh, years. We are better today at making things with fewer impunts than at any point in history. Businesses are the same way. Every year, businesses get slightly better at producing more and more stuff with fewer and fewer inputs. Uh, that in turn, raises their profitability. Uh, number three, innovation. Joe, what was the smartphone market worth in 1990? Right. <laughs> yeah. Zero. You mean flip phone? Zero. Flip phone market. Well, not even flip phone back then. It was the big, nope. it was like the bag it, phone. It was Zach Moore. It was a Zach Morris phone. Yeah, exactly. Well, what is the smartphone worth today? I don't know the exact figure, but it's hundreds of billions of dollars, right? That's a whole entire industry that didn't exist 30 years ago today, but now generates billions in revenue. Uh, the same with social media, the same with search, uh, search engine optimization, right? Zoom. These were innovations that came along, right? And opened up brand new markets that created billions of dollars in sales and in market value. Now, innovation also has a destructive portion, right? There, there are markets that disappear when innovations come along, but by and large, innovation leads to the expansion of the pie and leads to prosperity, which in turn leads to a value creation in the stock market. Those are some of the major growth drivers along with just population growth, right? Every year, there's more people on the planet, which means more consumers that are buying things from companies. And then there's also things like stock buybacks. Each year, companies spend billions of dollars repurchasing uh, their shares. They also pay out billions of dollars in dividends. And it's when you combine all of those factors together, that gives me confidence as an investor that five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the profits of the companies in the, the market, the U.S. stock market are going to be higher today Therefore, the stock market's going to be higher than you and your book. And, and, you know, luckily this isn't like a detective novel where I'm going to give away who did it, but, but you end it with advice to your younger self and also to readers out there. What's a piece of advice to your younger self that you have for stackers out there? Oh, I've made so many investing errors, so many money errors, right? But uh, by and large today, I've done uh, pretty well uh, financially because I've been focused on educating myself, uh, saving a big portion of my income and using that to build wealth, whether that's paying off debt or invest. So largely, I'm pretty happy with how things have turned out for me financially. But the number one thing that I would teach my, my younger self is that saving saving and your savings rate is more important uh, than your investing returns. This is especially true in the early years, right? If you have if you have $1,000 invested and you're the best investor in the world and you make a 20% return, well, great. You made $200, right? That's 
that's a 20% return, but $200 isn't going to uh, change your life. But if you, instead of saving $500 a month, really turbocharge your saving rate and find a way to save 1000 or 1500 or 2000 that is going to be the engine that really drives wealth creation over long periods of time. So I love the markets. I love investing. and I love studying how to get higher returns uh, than the market. But the number one thing that people can do to really enhance their wealth is find ways to make more money and save more money, period. The book is called Why Does the Stock Market Go Up? Everything You Should Have Been Taught About Investing in School But Weren't. I know that this is widely available. However, I also know that on your website, you've got even more stuff for people, correct? Yeah, I, I have a bunch of uh, materials that I that I create that I use to invest. So the checklist when I'm investing in individual companies, I also have like personal finance sheets that I, I've used for years to track my net worth and my spending and make sure that I'm on plan there. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, it's freely available on my website, which is brianferaldi.com. And you know what? If you don't know how to spell Brian Feraldi, we got you covered. It uh, will link to it on our show notes page <laughs> at stackingbenjamins.com. Just reach, go to Stacking Benjamins, hit today's show notes page. And we got you covered. Brian, man, you're the guy. I think we said this in Cincinnati. I feel like I could just hang out and talk to you all day because you are a natural born teacher, my friend. And it's uh, so fun following you on social media and everything you do. So congrats on helping people get better invested. I really appreciate the time. Thanks so much, Joe. I super appreciate being here now. Are we going to go play games now? Is yes. that what's happening? Because I'm yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, we, we are done. Let's go. <laughs> I'm Liz, the Chief Mom Officer, and when I'm not busy being the breadwinner of my family of five, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Brian Feraldi for joining us. And oh, gee, I don't think a lot of people realize how hard it is for a fund manager to beat the index and not, not the statistics that we always see, which are that they don't do it. But Brian makes some great points about why a lot of them don't do it. A lot of them don't beat it for some very good reasons. You wouldn't beat it either, where I'm sure at home, maybe they beat it, maybe they don't, but they probably have a better chance of beating it with their own money than they do with the fund running somebody else's money. Yeah, I mean, you just have to look at the financial incentives, right? It's better to be off plus or minus whatever than it is to be way wrong or way right. And even if there are people who beat the market, which there are. There are plenty of fund managers who beat their index you know, year after year. Just because you did it last year doesn't mean you're going to be able to do it this year. And so yeah. there's no uh, evidence of the persistence of that uh, success. So it's like, Bill's done it 10 years in a row. Does that mean he'll do it the 11th? Nope, doesn't. Means that he, he was great the last 10. That's a fact. But uh, just because he did it 10 in a row doesn't mean he'll be able to do it 11. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, Doug, they put what you value first. Doug doesn't value anything. He's shaking his head. He has no values. <laughs> he is valueless. I'm terrified of you asking me this question because no matter what I answer, it's wrong. <laughs> it doesn't matter if I value a great manicure or if I value great customer service somewhere or if I value my friends and family. Every time, whatever I answer, you're like, no, Doug. Nice try, but here's it's, what it's it your loved is. ones and your time. Yeah. See, I would have been wrong again. You were going to say Jets Pizza because we talked about that yesterday. Oh, Jets God, Pizza. Give me some Jets Pizza. Yes, Jets Pizza. Oh. So good. For those of you not uh, having, is, is Jets nationwide or just in Detroit? I don't. I don't know that there's any doubt it, here. No, it's a weird kind of setup they have. It's regional, kind of in the in the upper Midwest, but then they do have some stores down in Texas and and maybe like Missouri. But yeah, I mean, wherever you are, folks that you're listening, go to the interweb and see if you can't find a Jets pizza because I I say it's better. It's the best Detroit style pizza out there. I think it's better than Buddy's. Oh man, the originator of. Oh, it turns out there's a whole bunch here in Dallas. <laughs> There's a bunch of jets. Yeah. What the hell do I know? Because half of the Detroit area moved to Texas and they need their jets. You yeah. can't move to Texas and not have jets go with you. You there's, just have to. There's literally seven of them in, in the Dallas. Yeah. <laughs> jets, if you want to sponsor this podcast, it's just Joe at stackingbenchmans.com. Send us a. We'll, we'll do it for just pizza. You know, no money <laughs> oh, yes, involved. We just will. send us pizza. Just send us pizza. <laughs> I would. My nearest jets is a half hour away and I make that drive in a heartbeat. And now, now Matt at Haven Life is like, how do we turn a, a Haven Life commercial into a Jets pizza commercial? Thanks for sponsoring Jets. I love what they're doing at Haven Life, though, because they're committed to offering a modern way to buy life insurance or application. It's simple. 
<laughs> it's and, online. And, and they make the <laughs> the application process have those crispy edges, <laughs> kind of with cheese baked in. Is that mm-hmm. somewhere in the application process? <laughs> we call them the upper crust of insurance providers. Stackmanagement.com. <laughs> God, Slash Joe, you are a pro. Haven. That was impressive, actually. <laughs> Gotta give you that Slash one. Haven Life now. Oh, man. Today, today we're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to who? Uh, that's the question. Let's see. It is Jordan. Say hi, Jordan. Joe, OG, and Neighbor Doug. I love the Neighbor Dougs in the show more often, by the way. A while back, Joe won an epic rant regarding the FIRE acronyms, and I'd love to hear it again. So let's give it a go. My wife and I are both in our mid-30s. Our combined retirement account values are well over $600,000, so we're likely looking at a coast-fi situation. We may already be a lean-fi. We want to live in a trailer oh, by no, the river come on. and, you know, make our own clothes. We're likely not going to do that, and we're probably not going to retire anytime soon. So we're looking at a fat-fi situation. <laughs> Given our diligent savings, I'm somewhat worried that we're not going to have the spending habits that will deplete our savings. And I was hoping that you had some tools or thoughts on how to build spending habits over a lifetime or how to spend down an account value, given that people are so used to saving their Benjamins. I have stacked your super serious guide to modern money management, and I must say it's well written, but I haven't made it past the first few chapters yet. So I'm hoping it's later on, but I appreciate all of your thoughts, especially neighbor Doug's thoughts on this topic. Appreciate your time. Thank you guys. Take care. Man, this guy just hit all the buttons, I, didn't he? It's, uh, I'm I'm so conflicted. <laughs> I'm so conflicted. I'm like, ooh, I like this guy. Ooh, I hate this yeah, guy. I know it. He he nailed it. <laughs> I can't stand the I started uh, out putting him on my Christmas card list and then somewhere in there I'm like, I don't know. But then he came back when he when he gave you the yeah, he gave you the big compliment there again at the end. Oh, I'll give you my thoughts, Jordan. <laughs> OG, spending down your money, building your portfolio. Where do you where do you begin? I thought he said he wanted Doug's opinion. Mm, I don't. No, that was he just did that for comedic effect. We all really want to hear from you. I OG. see. It's all about you. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to share the limelight a smidge. Just a smidge, though. Just a smidge. I think that uh, you know the hard part for anybody who is a great saver is turning into a great spender. And it's not supernatural because if you have the characteristics of a great saver, you live within your means and you, you know, get joy out of making sure that your account balances are fully funded, you know, or your, you know, retirement accounts or whatever you're trying to do, that's where you find your energy. And so when you transition to the spending phase of your life or the distribution phase of your life, it feels very awkward because your whole life you've been trained to put money into those things, not to take money from those things. I think that the best way to do this is to figure out exactly what you want to do when you want to do it. Yeah, easier said than done, right? But have a sense of, okay, from a financial independence standpoint, we want to make work optional at age 50, or we want to make it work optional at age 60 or whatever. Figure out what you need to do on a frequent basis, whether that's annually or more frequent than that. Try to hit those targets. Every year, reevaluate to see whether or not you're on track for that, and then be okay with consuming the rest of that. And if you aren't okay with it, then you have to make the goal more challenging. Let's say that your goal is to be financially independent when you're 50, and to do that, you need to save $20,000 in your 401k. And you do that. And at the end of the year, you're like, I still have 20 grand left over that I could commit to savings. I have nothing immediate that I want to spend on this. What do I do with my 20 grand? And the only possible solution is you have to make your goal more difficult to reach. Otherwise, you won't have any energy around around any of those things. So instead of making it 50, try to make it 49. And if you constantly do that, either pulling the year forward or increasing the standard in your retirement. So instead of living on 100% of your life, you know, your income at 50, you want to live on 120%. That makes that more challenging to do. You have the ability to, you know, stay focused on it. But once you've gotten to the point where there is no circumstance in which you won't be successful, then I think you have have to start making a wish list of, since money is not required for savings anymore, what would we do? You know, why do we keep working? I do think that it's a little silly for people to say, 
my goal is to run out. Like I want to spend it down. Like, why would you want to do that? <laughs> You've spent your entire life accumulating money. It seems to me that you would want to keep on accumulating it for the rest of your life because that's such a great base of wealth that can be transitioned to other generations or to entities or things that you care about later in life. I, I don't, I don't quite get the whole idea of, I'm going to try to time this exactly right. So I hit the peak and then I, and then I zero it out exactly on my last breath. You know, I, I get that's like ultra efficient, you know, you've managed both sides of that spectrum exactly right. I lived my best life and I spent my retirement exactly perfectly. If you get to financial independence and you're 50 years old and you've got 5 million in the bank, why in the heck wouldn't you try to get it to 10 million? And then 20 into 50 into 100. And it's so almost so like trying to time your own market. The way you just you just phrased that, OG, of trying to you know reach the peak at just the right moment so that you run out when you're on your deathbed. You, you can't time the market. Why try to time your own market that way? I think about the stress involved with trying to do that, Doug. I mean, I just think about the, the stress level you create in your life where you're like, am I going to make it? I'm coming in hot. Right. Like just the, I wonder how much time that takes off of your life just trying to get that approach uh, right. I mean, I think about even fintech creators when they make these young companies and they have a burn rate, you know, and you talk to them about the stress of knowing that your money's going to run out in six months. And are you going to, are you, are you going to make it or not? But I do think though, oh, gee, this has a lot to do with why you begin with your values, right? Why begin with that goal setting? You know, a lot of people go, oh, I just want to manage my money for more. Well, if you're not focused on what you really, really want, and then figuring out what the fuel is to achieve that, there's going to be a ton of waste in that engine. Like it just isn't going to, it doesn't, I don't care about whether it's fat or lean or whatever thing you want to call it. Yeah. Like just, just begin with where you want to go. Well, and at 35 or whatever, however old Jordan said he was, the experiences that he's had in life are going to be different than the experiences that he has by the time he's 45. And so the things that are important to him and his family right now might be different in 10 years. And so there's nothing that's going to be set in stone. I think that financial planning is not a single activity. And this is what we try to tell our clients all the time. It's not the the document that you get or the the report is almost useless by the time you hit print on it because now there's new data and you know there's new experiences that you've had. The the market's done a different thing. Your job situation has changed. So the act of going through and thinking about how am I positioned on track for this thing that I want to do at 50 or at 60 or whatever, and then making slight adjustments along the way, I think becomes the beneficial exercise because there are going to be times where you're like, holy crap, the market's up 25% two years in a row. I'm well ahead of schedule. There's also going to be times where you're like, oh crap, the market's down 35%. I'm well behind you know, yeah. pace. So now what? And in those circumstances, you can't have a immediate negative reaction, just like you can't have the other side of the pendulum, like, woo, I don't have to do anything. I'm 25% ahead of schedule. <laughs> I'm good, you know, because you got to balance those things out. But every year, I think it's really important to have, you know, your savings goal, your, your fund goal, and your debt pay down goal. And wherever you feel like putting the emphasis that year is what is what you want to focus on. And then if you achieve that, and then you have still extra, then you have to have a place for that to go. I enjoy spending money, so this is not a very difficult thing for me to do. But, but I think <laughs> you make a different but, for other people. But I, <laughs> but I think you make a really good good point here that a lot of people, especially big time money nerds, solve for optimization. We solve to optimize everything, and I love the idea that you might feel different later. And that uh, solving for flexibility, I think, is way more important, especially at thirty five. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Jordan. And uh, uh, I'm not going to go on the epic rant again, but I but I do think that using all of these terms when people are brand new to this community, like if our goal is to bring our people along with us, nobody knows what those terms mean. Like there's a little community that does, and maybe there's something around the fact that that makes me feel included if I know the terms. I don't. I don't know. It just grinds me. So thank you, Jordan, for. <laughs> pushing my button. Wait a minute. OG was supposed to be the one going on the rant, not you, Joe. I think he said me, oh, Epic Rant, did he? this time. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Maybe it's just because I always expect OG to be the one going on the rant. <laughs> I know, right? Why did Joe on a rant? What are you I'm talking like about? like a conditioned lab rat. <laughs> it's OG's territory. Stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail. 
if you'd like to leave us a question and you know what, for being brave, what Jordan's going to get some of our amazing stacking Benjamin swag stacking Benjamin's.com slash voicemail to leave us a message. That's going to do it for today. Hey, we've got just a couple things. If you are in Boston tomorrow, tomorrow night, Doug, mom's neighbor, Doug, joining us for a rare appearance on the road. We will be at the Medford Public Library and uh, it looks like we got a lot of stackers coming out, which is going to be a ton of fun. Paula Pamp from Afford Anything also taking the train up from New York to join us in Boston. My co-author, Emily Guy Birkin, is going to be there. They got an open bar at the Medford Public Library, right? At the library. That's what you told me. <laughs> I think anything to get you there. And flight is canceled. I hate to pull the rug out from under you. I should go up. Well, let's wait and see, Doug. Let's wait and see. Like my parents used to say. Oh, <laughs> yeah, let's wait and see. Stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked to sign up so we can tell the library to have enough seats. If you can't tell us you're coming, just come on out. But then... Thursday, because we're expecting also a lot of people in New York City, and we have a, a fairly small venue in New York. We're having two sessions. If you'd like to join Emily and I for a smaller one during the day on Thursday, it's at 1 p.m. Uh, Stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked will tell you right where it is. It's in the East Village, but uh, come join us at 1 p.m. or at 7 o'clock. Stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked. Then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we will be in. In order, on Friday, we'll be in Baltimore. On Saturday, we will be in Washington, D.C., actually in Alexandria. And then on Sunday, we'll be in Philadelphia. And then next week, we're coming for you, Indianapolis, Columbus, and Cleveland. Oh, geez, all jealous. Is that what that was about? Was that jealousy? No, that was... Oh, I, I actually am jealous because I've never been to Boston, and I was wow. looking forward to going. But uh, because you scheduled, uh, because you changed the schedule, it jacked everything up. So I'm bummed that I couldn't make it. Because we had to push it back two months. Yeah. You wouldn't have actually been going to Boston. Medford's a delightful bedroom community of Boston. I was going to Boston. I don't know where you guys were going. <laughs> OG, where isn't OG supposed to be here? He's down in Faneuil Hall. He wasn't coming for the meetup. Doing all the touristy things. I don't know any of those terms. I would have been, it would have been cool, but um, it just did not come to pass. Didn't work. Stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked for all of our tour dates. And if you are not just looking for surround sound, you really need to build a better team. And don't we all need a great team around us? Stackingbenjamins.com slash OG leads you to the link to OG's team's calendar because he and his team of financial planners, they are taking new clients. A great way to upgrade your team is to make sure you have smart people around you. Stackingbenjamins.com slash OG. All right, that's going to do it for today. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, listen to Brian Feraldi. Like many things, investing well isn't so much about a cursory understanding of the nerdy stuff as it is a deep learning of the basics. Second, how's your risk management strategy? Whether you're Bruce Willis, Will Smith, or just a rock star in your own shower, protecting yourself is a key part of making sure your plans don't go off the rails. But the big lesson, don't make your investing decisions based on someone's dance moves. It sucks that if Bill Gates could have danced better back when Windows 95 launched, we'd be live from Joe's mom's neighbor's yacht off the coast of Monaco right now. So close. Thanks to Brian Feraldi for joining us today. His book, Why Does the Stock Market Go Up? Everything You Should Have Been Taught About Investing in School But Weren't is available in your school's library, hopefully. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. 
So, say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at The Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What happens here stays here. I went to a movie theater last week. And what, why was there applause no, after he, that? You here's why I really a, am bragging. Applause? I did. Yes. Here. I've got my own. No, that's the wrong. I guess that's the yeah. wrong yeah. button there. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the right response. I went to a COVID Petri dish last week. <laughs> there we go. I went into a movie theater and I saw this film. This is uh, Sandra Bullock and uh, Channing Tatum in a little new movie called The Lost City. Oh, God. So dreamy. You saw this? You led me straight to the lost city. Now, prepare to die. There were just hundreds of snakes in this temple just waiting for us to show up. What? Why aren't they biting that guy? This is ridiculous. Delete. 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 Oh. Listen, Loretta, we need you to promote your new book on the Lost City. You can't spend your life in the bathtub drinking Chardonnay with eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, the world's sexiest cover model, Dash McMahon! You do know you're not Dash, right? Dash is a character I made up. Dash! I, I... Oh, my God. Oh, crap. Miss Sage, I enjoyed your book about the lost city, and I believe you're the one who can help me find its treasure. I have to respectfully decline. I'm afraid I must. It turns be. out that uh, Daniel Radcliffe, whose voice you hear right there, Daniel Radcliffe, the same guy who was Harry Potter, believes that this romance novelist has something really going on with this idea of a lost city. There really is a lost city. He thinks he's found it. Well, he's already uh, spending a bunch of money, digging it up. He bought part of an Island where the lost city supposedly is. And, and he thinks that Sandra Bullock can translate things for him. So, uh, Channing Tatum, who plays her cover model, who of course always has his shirt, like half ripped off plays this, uh, guy who, uh, thinks he really is the character who's in the book joins her on this expedition into the jungle and hilarity ensues. Well, let's actually talk about the hilarity. I was excited to see this movie. I was excited to just go into a movie theater and relax and laugh for a couple hours. And you know what? That's exactly what happened here. This movie's pretty dumb. It's pretty formulaic, very straightforward, but OG, a lot of stuff blows up. There are a lot of chases, a lot of fights, a lot of, a lot of uh, thrilling moments where they have a little, you know, it's got a little Indiana Jonesy feel to it. So is this movie going to take home any uh, uh, awards next year? I wouldn't count on it, but is this movie... Will it earn a slap? <laughs> I, don't, I don't even think it'd be worth slapping over. Ah. But if you're looking for an hour and a half to two hours of mindless entertainment while you're on a plane... And you just want to laugh through a movie? Sure. So I'm going to give this one kind of a thumb sideways. Didn't, uh, you know, the movie was a waste of time. 
but it was a fun waste of time. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Yeah. Thanks. I'm never seeing it. Why are you never seeing it? Why? <laughs> I'm a duck. Why? <laughs> so, you just told me it's a waste of time. There are so many other fun ways I can waste my time than it was a fun ride. watching this pablum. You don't like Sandra Bullock? I like Sandra Bullock. You know, that's a great question because everybody goes all gaga over Sandra Bullock. I like her in her more serious roles than I do in, in this kind of stuff. Not that she doesn't have comedic chops or, you know, have skills to do these kinds of movies, but I'm not the huge fan that a lot of people are. I think she's great. And uh, Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum. Hard pass. Really? Hard pass. Yeah. Oh, my God. You didn't like him in 21 Jump Street? That was hilarious. Uh, No, I like the other guy better. That was pretty funny. Why can't I think of the other guy? Jonah Hill. Jonah? Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill. Yeah. I thought he... I thought he was the real comedy there. I think he set up the comedy. I thought the two of them together was so damn funny. I thought that was great. By the way, Brad Pitt has a cameo in this movie that is hilarious, which is, which might be the best part of the movie. Brad Pitt might actually steal I've heard this that. Movie. I've heard that that's the best part of the movie. And one critic I uh, saw briefly, I'll say even unintentionally, uh, but it just kind of popped up on my screen. He said, if you've got, if you want to put butts in seats in a theater, which is the number one goal ever, but especially now trying to get people back into a theater because they're not all idiots like you, Joe, you better say that Brad Pitt is in your movie. And they didn't, they haven't done that. I will say the best cameo, if and you they haven't, don't. yeah, they don't, but the best cameo of Brad Pitt is in True Romance and early, oh, I just drew a blank. Who's the Pulp Fiction guy? Why can't I think of his name? Tarantino. Tarantino, early Tarantino film. It's actually part of the trilogy with Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction is True Romance. And they're all, that's all a, a, a blended trilogy. And Brad Pitt shows up as a stoner in that movie. And I don't know if you can call it a cameo because it's one of his early roles, but oh my God, he's hilarious. Well, maybe we go see that instead. Yeah, go look for that in the theater. But True Romance, very good movie. You're still here? You want more? Okay, we'll give you more. You know what? How about this public service announcement from NHTSA? Distracted driving is a serious problem, stackers, on our roadways, leading to the deaths of thousands of people and injuries in the hundreds of thousands. Each year, when you take your eyes and your focus off the road, even for a second, it can be deadly, not just for you, but for other drivers, bicyclists, pedestrians. Sadly, many Americans use their cell phones while driving, whether it's texting, checking emails, scrolling media feeds, or any other form of distraction. Drivers are putting themselves and others around them at great risk. It's important to know that 48 states ban texting and driving. Also, 25 states prohibit all drivers from using cell phones while driving. Distracted drivers are not only putting people at risk, they're probably also breaking the law. Look, it's dangerous to use your cell phone behind the wheel. And that's why law enforcement officers write tickets and enforce hands-free and anti-texting and driving laws. When you're driving, put down your phone, keep your hands on the wheel, your eyes on the road, and your mind on the task of driving. Remember, you drive, you text, you pay. Brought to you by NHTSA. Now you can get on with your day, stackers.